The title of today's sermon is Comfort in the Day of Wrath. Comfort in the Day of Wrath. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 11, Paul provides three instructions for getting ready for the coming day of the Lord. To understand these, uh, to understand these we need to ask certain question, or answer three questions concerning the text. The three questions I'll be asking concerning our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11 are, first, what is the day of the Lord? What is the day of the Lord? That's our first question. Secondly, how will it come? How will the day of the Lord come? Thirdly, how do you get ready for it? How do you get ready for it? Last I was here, we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, where, which concerns the rapture and the resurrection Paul's purpose for sharing what he did with the Thessalonian church was to comfort them according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. Like last week's passage, Paul provides his purpose for writing our text in verse 11, which is again for our comfort and for building up one another or edification. I emphasize the author's intent for writing so that we can avoid two primary pitfalls when people read passages like these concerning eschatology or the last times. The first is to become overly preoccupied about the end times to a degree where people begin to do things that they ought not do, like predict when the world will come to an end or become paranoid in trying to survive the day of the Lord. Maybe you've heard of people like that. Maybe you've heard of cults like that, like we got to know the date or I know the date. Uh, you know, I remember I used to travel a lot. I used to be a military facility planner for the Navy. And I remember going throughout the United States, always seeing billboards, you know, the, you know 2012. I don't know if you guys remember that. 2012, the end of the Lord, you know. Or maybe the minds ran out of ink. I don't know. Figure, we'll figure it out, you know. Um, today's passage is important for two reasons. One, so we don't become like that. That is not God's intent for us to read a passage about the day of the Lord, the day of wrath, and to freak out, basically. There's tons of movies. There's crazies. There's cults that want to convince you to give you their money or their time or, or more so that um, essentially, you could do what they want to do, so that they can deceive you into believing that Christ has already come, or that He's going to, or, or that they know the day or the hour. We'll see shortly that Christ has said Himself that no one knows the day or the hour except the Father alone. We see this in Matthew 24 and Acts chapter 1, verse 7. We'll read those shortly. But there's another extreme that I want us to keep in mind as we read today's passage. The other one is uh, apathy, basically, where people, because they don't understand eschatology or find it strange, they ignore it altogether. Today's passage, I hope, will show you what proper preparation for the day of the Lord looks like. It doesn't look like going crazy and freaking out, predicting when the day of the Lord will come, but it also doesn't look like apathy, thinking it doesn't matter. You know, this subject that we're talking about both last week and this week, and when we get into 2 Thessalonians, eschatology matters. It's, it's, it's sort of ignored a lot uh, by a lot of Christians, you know, and I, I understand, you know, there's soteriology, the study of salvation, or ecclesiology, the study of the church, things that tend to affect us more in our everyday life, but Paul's purpose for writing is to show us that this applies to you now. When you leave this place, when you're in your car, when you're at your job, when you're with your family, when you go to sleep, knowing eschatology matters for your life. Doctrine matters because sound doctrine produces sound living. A lack of sound doctrine leads to a lack of sound living. It's also important for protecting us. We'll see later that Paul uses the analogy of armor. You know, we, maybe you've read Ephesians chapter 6 where he tells us to stand firm, to be ready, to stand, to do battle in the heavenly places against this present darkness. And there's a little bit of that here. It's not so much about the fighting as, is it, as it is much about being alert. And so we need to read passages like this so that we can have a proper alertness about us. So when you hear you know, like Christ will, you know, like he said in Matthew chapter 24, where people claim to be the Christ or they say the end is near, the end is here. Um, we, you know, we can be discerning and, and not fall for such lies. It, it protects you. In other words, doctrine, apart from helping you to live a life that looks like Christ, it protects you from those who would deceive you or hurt you. It equips you also so that you can be a minister of God's reconciliation, but also of God's protection. 
you know, I, I always emphasize this, I think, as much as I can, when I'm here, you are the ministers, according to Ephesians chapter 4, all of you, some of you actually are, but like, you know, but, but all of you are ministers of God, and you know, you come here every Sunday so you can be equipped for the work of ministry, and so I hope as you hear this message today that it will capacitate you when you hear your friends or your family or people in your workplace or, or people that you minister, that you can comfort them and build them up with these words as Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, intended for them to be done so. So this brings us to our first question. What is the day of the Lord? I'll provide a preliminary definition, then we'll look at some scripture. The day of the Lord, in essence, is the time of God's wrath on sinners and the salvation of his saints. When the day of the Lord is not a new concept, this isn't something that Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is introducing for the first time in Revelation. This is something that we find in the Old Testament. And before we look at those passages, what you need to know about the day of the Lord as it's revealed in the Old Testament, um, its first revealing comes through the prophets, both the, the greater and lesser prophets, and they speak about it in such a way that God it has a day in which his wrath, his judgment on the nations that have put Israel into exile will be judged. Now, when we read that, it's not because God hates non-Jews. It's rather the case that these nations, remember, at, these time, at this time, the nations are pagan. They don't like God. They, they hate God. They mock Yahweh, the one true and living God. And so God in his prophecies revealed through men like Isaiah or Zechariah or Amos or Joel or Malachi, etc., uh, his purpose for declaring the day of the Lord is to also, just like Paul, give comfort and confidence to his people that despite their sin, despite their rebellion, God will fulfill his promise. God is immutable. According to Hebrews, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. You change, I change, he does not change. And praise the Lord. We change, and that's for the better, because there's some things that aren't so great about you, and it's good that you change. Same for me. But God is perfect. He's holy. There's everything about him is good and glorious, and that will never change. And so when we look at these texts in the Old Testament, we'll see that when the Lord speaks about the day of the Lord, he's speaking about the judgment and the wrath on these pagan nations for their persecution of his people, for their mockery of his name and of his people and his promises. And so when we come back to our text here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul wants to connect that day with the hope that you and I have. Uh, you know, maybe some of you are Jewish and I just don't know, uh, but for most of us, we're probably thoroughly Gentile. But the point of today's passage is to tell you this, that you too, this day of the Lord, should give you comfort, regardless of your ethnicity. You know, this is a promise for you. The day of wrath is a day to be feared by those who are outside God's promises. But for you, that is not the case. For you, this is a word of comfort and confidence to build you up. So if you join me to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah will be the first scripture reference we'll look at this morning. Isaiah chapter 2, uh, verses 12 to 22. So Isaiah... It's just right before Jeremiah, Isaiah chapter 12, or chapter 2, verses 12 to 22. This is the reading of God's word. This is the day of reckoning that Yahweh promises in verses 12 to 22. It reads this, For Yahweh of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and high and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be made low. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the high mountains and against all the hills that are lifted up, against every lofty tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, against all the desirable craft. The loftiness of man will be bowed down, and the men who are high will be made low, and Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks and to the holes of the ground before the dread of Yahweh and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship 
worship in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the dread of Yahweh and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? What you need to know about the day of the Lord is there is one, that there is a day of reckoning. This is our hope. This is, I mean, first and foremost in its context, what would what does Isaiah mean to the people he's writing to? He's trying, like I said formerly, he's encouraging them that the, you know, the idols, uh, the people who have taken them into exile, they don't have the last word. Their pride will be brought low. There is redemption for the people of Israel through God's reckoning. This is the hope of Israel, and this is the hope of the church, that God will reckon accounts, that he will bring down the pride of those who have resisted him, and that he will protect and save his people. He will also humiliate the idols. Secondly, if you join me to Zechariah chapter 14, this one is one of the minor prophets. It's right before Malachi, or as some call him Malachi, the Italian prophet. He's not Italian, you know. Um, but it's going to be in Zechariah chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 to 8. This is just some of what is written concerning the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. It reads this. Behold, a day is coming for Yahweh when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. Indeed, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city will go forth in exile, but those left of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as the day when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel indeed. You will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And it will be in that day that there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle and, and it will be a unique day which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but it will be that at evening time there will be light. It will be in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And so what we see here in Zechariah, Zechariah is a great book, by the way, if you ever get the chance to read it. It's basically the revelation of the Old Testament. If, you, I mean, if you're really into eschatology and you like revelation, you're really going to like Zechariah. You kind of see the origins of characters you see, uh, maybe not all of them, but most of them in the book of Revelation. Like, for example, uh, the horsemen that you see in Revelation, like, uh, you know, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you will. You see them in Zechariah first. That's where we're first introduced to them in Zechariah. You see, or maybe you remember, for those of you who have read it in Revelation, uh, the great, pro, uh, the great uh, harlot uh, of Babylon, if you will. You see her uh, as a young child, actually, as a little girl in Zechariah, you know, before her, you know, in her infants, the, the infants, uh, infancy of her wickedness until she's fully grown in Revelation. But Zechariah, who's, an, uh, you know, very much an eschatological prophet, he speaks about this day, this day of judgment that is coming in which not only will there be judgment, but it will be judgment on all the nations, on all the peoples. No one will be exempt from this. But this isn't just a random sort of judgment. This is a judgment in which there will be battle done. Maybe this is sort of reminiscent of what you've heard about a certain battle in the book of Revelation as well. Maybe Armageddon in which the Lord will reveal himself. He will come in his glory with his holy ones, which we also read in First Thessalonians. And then he will do battle against the nations, and he will destroy them. He will crush them. Psalm 2 speaks of this. You know, if, if you'll join me there too as well, Psalm 2 sings about this coming day. And Psalm 2, the first part, well, we'll read, well, we won't read all of it, but we'll read some of it. But just to give a little context, Psalm 2 sings about this coming day. It says this in verse 1 in Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, 
Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son today. I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. So now, O king, Show insight, take warning, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So what's the connection between Psalm 2 and uh, Zechariah 14? Zechariah 14, there will be battle between the nations and Yahweh. And God will defeat them. He will subdue them. Uh, you know, I know we went to Psalm 2, we'll come right back to that, but Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, it says he's going to, in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem, on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that the half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. This is, you know, and I, I, I have to say this with a slight caveat, there's still more I have to learn in this particular passage, but what I learned in my own studies about the Mount of Olives, this is sort of significant, that the Lord, when he returns, he will come back on the Mount of Olives. In Jewish history, the Mount of Olives is a place of retreat. It's a place of loss. It's a place where the Jew, when the Jews lost the battle, um, this is the direction they would go. This is the place they would flee to because they lost. They failed. They did not make it. And so when Christ comes back, he comes to the primary, he comes precisely to the place where the Jews flee in failure, to the place they lose. This is where Christ comes back to take his stand against the nations, to give them victory. And that place, the Mount of Olives, the place of their failure, their defeat, will be torn in two as far as east is from west. Maybe you've heard songs about that, talking about Christ's love for you on the cross. And it's true. You know, he does love you as far as east is from west. You know, um, that's also in Isaiah. And, uh, but here, there's sort of a similar connotation happening here, that the defeat, the failure of God's people will be no more because God cannot defeat it. He is undefeated. He is the Lord, invincible. This is the God we serve. This is Yahweh. This is Christ, our King. And so when, he, when we sing about it in Psalm 2, when David, uh, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, writes Psalm 2, you know, we, we see that, you know, the, the nations will rage against God. They will rebel against him. And God's response to that is to mock them, to laugh at them, because there is no hope for them. And in fact, he will be sending them his anointed, the Lord, the chosen one. The chosen one, by the way, you know, if you've ever wondered, you know, why, why do we call Christ what he is, or why, like, where do we find Christ in the Old Testament? You know, where's, I don't see the word Messiah. <coughs> Whenever you see the word anointed in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for that is Meshach, which means the chosen one or anointed. And so the word Meshach is where we get our English variant, the Messiah. <coughs> Meshach in Greek is Christos, or what we say in English, the Christ. So if you've ever been looking for the Messiah in the Old Testament, where is he? Here he is in Psalm 2. The Christ, none other than Jesus Christ, the chosen one. You know, he is the one who's going to subdue these nations. And so what is the right response of the kings in verses 10 to 12 in Psalm chapter 2? It says this again. So now, O kings, show insight. Take warning. In other words, watch out. If you're smart, if you know better, O judges of the earth, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now is your time, O kings or judges. Now is the time to fear Yahweh, now is the time to rejoice with trembling. And verse 12, kiss the son lest he become angry. This is to say to the kings of the earth, those who are in positions of power and authority, they should bow the knee. They should kiss the son to recognize his authority. His authority is greater than theirs. This is a word to our own governor, Gavin Newsom, or Joe Biden, or Kamala Harris, or even Donald Trump, or whoever is all, you know, the European Union, the Klaus Schwab, you know, whoever, you know, uh, Dave Soros, you know, you know, this is the time for you and I and them to repent, to kiss the ring, because ultimately, regardless of what you hear in podcasts or the news, you know, hey, you will own nothing, you'll be happy, this is the new world order, and yes, all those things may indeed occur, but even they will not have the last word. Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, I don't know, whoever else is out there, I don't know, um, all the crazies, you know. They will not have the last word. They will not win. 
God is victorious. His Messiah, his anointed one will win. This is your God, if you are a Christian. This is your God who you are waiting for. The God who gives you comfort and confidence in the midst of high rents and crazy elections. And, you know, I don't know, Antifa or BLM or other crazy crises and stuff. You know, this is the God you and I are waiting for. He is a great God and a glorious God. If he is not your God, this is the God who will judge you. This is the God who will crush you under his feet, under his might, if you don't know him. And I would exhort you, and I say this often because we have a lot of children, just because your parent is a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Or, you know, maybe your child is a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian either. You know, uh, you may have grown up going to church, but that doesn't make you reconciled to God. You need to be reconciled to him. I exhort you, I urge you, be reconciled to him. Because if not, the day of the Lord is not a day of comfort or edification for you. It is to tear you down. It is to stress you out. There is no hope for you in this life and in this world if Jesus is not your Lord, if you have not been reconciled. And I would say this too, if he is not your Lord, he is neither your Savior. This is to say if Jesus has saved you, if you've really been saved by Christ, that means he is also your Lord. You know, we we can call God Father and Friend, and he tells us to do that. You know, he is your Father if you are a Christian. There are no fatherless in the household of God. There are no orphans. We are all children of God if you are a Christian, if you've been reconciled to God. But if you are not, if he is not your Lord, that is to say, if you see what God's Word says and it doesn't change your life. There is no transformation. There's no different living in your life that corresponds and conforms to the word of God. Christ, God, is not your father. According to the word, your father is Satan. You belong to the world, which is to say you will be with these nations who will rise up against Yahweh and you will be crushed with them. But this is to bring us back to our text. Now now we know the day of the Lord. It's a great and glorious day where God will wreak havoc and reckon against those who have persecuted his people, who have caused suffering upon them. Um, But for those who are in Christ, this is such a comforting day because, you know, maybe maybe you can join me here too in Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, I want to show you why this day matters to you and me. Like, what's its purpose, basically? You know, when we go to Romans chapter 13, you know, usually we look at, oh, forgive me, it's actually 12, sorry. Um, Romans chapter 12, um, it's never taking, I wanna, I'll want i just start in 17 for context, uh, verses 17 to 20. So this is Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 20. It reads this, never paying back evil for evil to anyone, respecting what is good in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, being at peace with all men, never taking your own revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. So why are we looking at this? You know, this this is to say, um, in Romans chapter 12, it's about Christian living. It's about as far as it depends on you, you make it all the efforts you can to live at peace with all men, knowing not to take vengeance for yourself, according to verse 19. How come? What happens when someone cuts you off? You almost get in a car accident. You have a family member who has wronged you, or maybe you got fired wrongly at a job. I don't know. You, you could just, the list can go on and on. Who's going to make things right? Who's, or we can even think of even worse and terrible things, you know, people, you know, being abandoned by their own government in North Carolina uh, to, to die, you know, a terrible death at, you know, the, at the Hurricane Helen over there. Or you might think about the little children who are boarded almost on a daily basis in this country and around the world. Uh, who is going to give them justice? Where is justice for them? Well, are we to go marching out in the street and demand it from our government? No, we're not. You know, it's not to say that we don't hold government accountable, but it is to say we don't seek justice the way the world seeks justice. They do that because they have no hope. They have nothing to look forward to, and so that is why they demand it now, and they wreak havoc on everyone else, unfortunately. Our hope is in the coming of Christ, the day of the Lord. Our hope, we know we we don't have a need or necessity to be vengeful, to take revenge into our own hands because a day is coming when justice, the justice that was not given to you, will be done. 
the justice that was denied you, that was never given to you, or that was ignored, it will come in the day of the Lord. So trust him. Look forward to that. Let it comfort you. If there's pain in your life, if, if you've been wronged by someone in your past, or who knows, maybe someday in your future, I don't know. I, I, I want you to look forward to this. And more importantly, God wants you to look forward to this. You know, all scriptures God, God breathed according to 2 Timothy 2, 3, 16. And it's useful and, you know, for teaching, rebuking, instructing the man of God so that he may be complete for every good work. This is to say, if you're going to be complete for the work of ministry, for every good work that God has predestined for you to do according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, you need to know about this because it gives you hope. When people do wrong to you, when they do bad to you, look forward to this day. And it's not that we're looking for, yeah, God's going to get them. <laughs> you know, not at all. You know, we want them to be reconciled to God. But it is to say justice will be done. He will not let you go unavenged. He cares. You may not even care. And this is the reason why it matters too. The reason why we don't avenge ourselves is because we don't do justice the right way all the time. You know, our tendency is to be too vengeful, to be too angry, or sometimes, in the, sometimes not even enough. God is perfect. He knows the right amount of justice to deal that you can't because maybe you're too spiteful or not, or you don't care enough. Maybe you're apathetic. And so the justice that comes from God is perfect. And so the day of the Lord, its purpose is to give us hope that you don't have to take your own vengeance. God will take care of that. He will establish his justice in the land. The last thing I want us to see is its connection to Christ's coming. If you'll join me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, that's just a book over from Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. And we're going to see some more passages here, but I'll just show you one for now. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, this is Paul's introduction. But he says, and uh, gosh, I'll just start in verse 8. Why not? Um, you know, he's giving thanks. But in verse 8, he says, Who will also confirm you to the end beyond reproach in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? You know, um, We'll, we'll see some more passages on this, but I, I want you, well, I mean, heck, we could go back to our passage. If you just go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. This is a day speaking about Christ coming, you know, uh, about Christ's return. You know, we read this in the last passage in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, we talked basically about the rapture. I, I shared a little bit of Greek with you, like Perusa and Harpiso. You know, this is, the, the rapture isn't some sort of random event where we all just disappear and we're with Christ and it's awesome. It will be awesome. But it, it's, I, I reminded you last time uh, that I was here, the, the idea with the rapture is that we're going out of this world to greet our king. He's coming as a conquering king. He's not a child in a manger anymore. He's not baby Jesus. He's Lord Jesus Christ, you know. He, we will go out to meet him, to greet him as the conqueror and the rightful king of this world of this world, the both the dead and the living, in Christ. And so when Christ comes back, this is none other than the day of the Lord. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a small detail, but I want to share it with you to share this, that Jesus is God. I mean, we, you know, you already know that, most of you, but I just want to share this doctrine with you so it's in your mind and it's in your head when people will challenge you, I don't know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or maybe other cults, you know, like, oh, I don't know if Jesus is God, you know, yeah, I know John 1, 1, but what else? Well, the day of the Lord is connected to Christ, you know, that day of Jesus Christ is the day of wrath, that day of Jesus Christ is the day when the rapture happens, the day of Jesus Christ is here in our passage, the day of the Lord, and so Christ is the Lord, he is Yahweh, he is the one Israel has been waiting for, their Messiah, he is the one that you and I, the church, are waiting for and looking forward to, Jesus is Yahweh. He is the eternal one, the one who was and is and is to come. He is our hope. And so just concluding this first part, what is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath on sinners where he will bring justice finally. And lastly, it is salvation for saints. So I just want to end this first part to say again, if you're not a Christian, if you're here and you haven't been reconciled to God, maybe you say you are, but you're still living in sin, the day of the Lord is coming for you. We'll see in our next section on how it will come. It's going to come in three ways. It's going to come by surprise. It's going to come suddenly. It's going to come inescapably, which is to say you will not be ready for it if you are not in Christ. You will not be prepared. It will come in a time you don't expect it to come. It will come suddenly, and you cannot escape it. There is no way out. 
in our passage today, too, is to warn you, for those of you who are Christians, even for you, not to be asleep. That is, don't be apathetic. Be ready. This is something to get ready for. And we'll look a little bit more at it later on when we talk about the armor of God. Like armor, again, it's not so much the emphasis this time is not so much on doing the fighting that we see in Ephesians chapter 6, but really about the alertness. The people who wear armor are soldiers. Soldiers wear armor, especially in this time. They, they wear, soldiers wear armor, and when they wear their armor, it's because they're standing at attention. You know, they're not going to sleep. Uh, armor is also not very comfortable to sleep in, you know, as far as I know. But, you know, uh, people, you don't see people sleep in armor. And so all this is, it's not just for those who are not Christian, but it's for you too, dear saints. If you are a Christian, stay alert, be awake, stay, stay sober. Don't be drunk. Don't be asleep. So let's move on to our, our next section. How will it come? It's going to come in three ways, as I said already surprisingly, suddenly, and inescapably. This is the way in which the day of the Lord will come. I want to, I said earlier that I would look at, um, well, no, we'll, we'll just go here. Um, so let's look at how is it going to come by surprise? Like basically, uh, no one knows the day of the hour. I said I'd look at some passages about that first, so let's look at them. Matthew 24, verse 36, if you join me there, and Matthew chapter 24, that's kind of like if you're really, into eschatology and the Gospels, that's like the chapter, Matthew 24. Um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 says this, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father alone. So another reminder, if someone comes and tells you, Hey, I know when the day of the Lord is going to happen. I know when Christ is going to come back. Stay away from them. You know, Mason, go away. Maybe don't Mason, but you know, like, you know, just don't listen to those people. They're charlatans. They want to take your money or your time, your body, or other things. Stay away from them. They're evil wolves. They, uh, God will judge them. The day of the Lord is precisely for people like that. You know, uh, you could also look, if one verse is not enough, I mean, that's straight from the Lord's mouth, but he says again in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, if you'll join me there, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, written by the beloved physician Luke, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, right before his ascension, Christ says this. It says, But he said to them, this is Christ speaking, by the way, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has set by his own authority. So I emphasize this to emphasize to you, don't be the type of person like, we got to find the day of the Lord, the Bible code. I found it, you know. No, you didn't. You know, you just wasted your money and your time and my time too, you know. Um, you know, we, we need to be aware, you know, uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's people who want to deceive you and make you think we can know the day or the time of the Lord. Well, we can't. It's, it's only for God the Father alone to know, and it's for you to trust him and to look forward to. This is your hope. You don't need to know that. You know, I have a, a precious little daughter, and when she gets older, she's probably going to ask me why, 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 and I'll probably answer as much as I can, but it's not for her to know everything. You know, uh, you know, we're going to eat. You don't need to know what we're going to eat, but we're gonna, there's going to be food on the table. We will survive. Don't worry, you know. Um, and, you know, I think I'm a pretty good dad, you know, according to me. My wife says so, too. You know, but Christ, who is an infinitely better father than I am, you know, who is trust, trustworthy and good, you don't need to know because it's not the, the thing about the day of the Lord is that it's about trusting his character. Do you believe him really? Not just believe in him, but believe him. Do you believe that he is who he claims to be, that he's good, that he's faithful, that he fulfills his promises? And if you do, hold fast to his word. You don't need to know the day or the time. You know, there are some things that are given for us to know, and God has given us that in his word, and there are some things that are not. God is our father again, and like a father, he has no obligation or duty to tell us every single detail. He, we, he, that is not owed to you, and it is not owed to me. He is the Lord. He is God. You know, again, he is our friend and he is our father, but he is greater than you. You are not equals, you know, which is why we don't call him like daddy God or anything like that. You know, it's, yeah, I mean, really, it's blasphemous. It's sacri sacrilegious, really. We, we do call him dad, but we really call him father. That's, that's really the sort of attitude you ought to have about God, a sort of reverence because of how great and good and glorious he is. And so, we see that we do not know the day or the hour of the day uh, of the Lord. Next, I, concerning its surprise, we're going to kind of get a mixture of these things. So as we read these coming passages, I want you to pay attention to the 
elements of surprise and suddenness and this inescapability. We're going to look at two things. First, that the day of the uh, Lord, it's like the days of Noah. If you remember Noah in Genesis, like chapter six, you know, the Lord tells Noah, hey, you know, there's going to be a flood. And, you know, this is a time where there's a water canopy over the earth. And if you're interested about that, talk to me about it afterward. But like rain really wasn't a thing, you know, so it's like rain, flood, what is that? You know, it's like, doesn't matter. Just get ready for it. And, you know, Noah's like, aye, aye, captain. And so, but in his building the ark, in his preparation for the day of wrath, in which God literally killed, all, you know, almost everybody, in, everybody on the earth minus a family, uh, people weren't ready for that day. People were going about doing whatever they wanted. If you'll join me to Matthew 24 again, Matthew 24, this time verses 37 to 39, we'll see what people were doing in the days of Noah and why it matters to you and me right now. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39, it reads this. For just as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. And, you know, the coming of the Son of Man, that's none other than Christ. That's the title he loved to use about himself coming from Daniel chapter 7. You know, the one speaking to the Ancient of Days is the Son of Man, who is the anointed, well, the Meshach, the Messiah. In Greek, the Christos, the Christ, that is Jesus. He is the Son of Man. When the Son of Man, the Son of God, Christ comes back, it will be as in the days of Noah. People are going to be going about their own business. They're not going to care, in other words. These are the people who are asleep, basically. They're sort of apathetic. They're doing their own thing. If you'll join me now to Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter, chapter 17, so just two gospel accounts away, back to our beloved physician Luke, physician Luke, Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 30, it states this. And just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And it was the same as in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day of the Son of Man. Uh, on, on that, it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And so, what do we see in the days of Noah and the days of Lot? You know, I, and maybe I'll focus a little bit on the days of Lot since we looked at the days of Noah. In the days of Lot, you know, God explicitly warns him. He sends two angels to warn Lot. Hey, look, we're you know, God's going to blow this place up literally. And, you know, you know, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of guys who show up. They want to rape the angels, to engage in homosexual rape. And, yes, it's, it's a very terrible place. It's very evil and very bad. You know, hospitality was an issue, like we read in Ezekiel, but there's a lot of other issues, too. You know, and, yeah, homosexuality is one of them, you know, uh, and sexual perversity. But uh, the point for mentioning this is to say that the people, they, they were not prepared. And the reason they weren't prepared is because they didn't believe. They weren't saved. They weren't looking forward to the coming of Christ. You see, you know, one of the evidences about you, one way someone should be able to tell that you're a Christian, if you are one, is that you have a hope. You have something you're looking forward to. You have a sort of expectation. You know, and, you know, if I'm looking forward to, you know, I don't know, my daughter's now old enough, maybe, you know, some of you kids are old enough, but like if your parents told you, or I don't know, I mean, even as adults, we'd probably still be excited. I don't know anymore, but like Disneyland with all the lines and stuff and the woke stuff. But anyway, you know, like if your parents told you like, hey, we're going to Disneyland, like, yes, this is awesome. You know, uh, you're like, get ready. You know, you're going to brush your teeth and, you know, you're, you have this expectation, man, we're going to Disneyland. This is going to be so awesome. And so you're not staying in bed. You're not watching TV. You're, you know, you, it doesn't even matter if you're sick. You're like, I'm ready to go to Disneyland. Like you're, the evidence of your expectation or your hope is the way that you live right now in the present. And so if you are a Christian, there should be a sort of expectancy in your life that people should be able to visibly see. Like you're not, live, you're not like other people. You're not living for now. You don't despair like other people despair when bad things happen in this life. You're different from other people. You're looking forward to something. What is it? Tell me, you know. And that's your opportunity to share the gospel. Praise the Lord, you know. Maybe you could even do it this Saturday. Totally recommended, you know. Um, but uh, this, you know, um, 
the reason the people in the days of Lot weren't prepared is because they didn't believe. And because they didn't believe, it was evidenced in the way they lived. They were asleep. Like Lot's uh, brother, uh, potential sons-in-law, he had two men who were going to marry his daughters. And he warned them. He told them, hey, we got to get out of here. There's going to be fire and brimstone. And they don't get ready. And, you know, along with everyone else, they die. They get buried in the fire and in the brimstone. And so w- what do we see? We see that the day of the Lord came as a surprise. No one was ready for it. They were unsuspecting. And it came suddenly. It came all at once. It's not going to take time. It's like now, bam, here it is. And lastly, inescapably, there's no way out. The time to be reconciled to God is now, not, not later, but now. Because when it comes, there will be no hope anymore. You know, um, I, I don't know if I'd rec- I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but, you know, like Dante's Inferno, it's a kind of a famous book. You know, it goes into like, you know, like Dante has his vision of heaven and purgatory and, um, you know, hell and all and stuff like that. It's a, it's a fictional work. It's not biblical. It's not, it's not nonfiction. But, you know, there, there is something interesting written in the first book, Inferno, which is about hell. You know, the, according to Dante, you know, like when they enter hell, there's a writing that says, abandon all hope ye who enter here. In other words, when you go to hell, there just is no more hope. No one is coming for you. You are gone. There is no hope for you. This is the day of the Lord for those who are not in Christ. If you have not been reconciled to God, those words ring true for you too. Once that happens, there is no more hope. It is too late. There comes a time where the day of the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor, like right now, this sort of time period we're in, it's not called a day, it's called a year. This is a long time that we get to enjoy the the opportunity to be reconciled to God, to hear the gospel, to be reconciled to him. But it will not last forever. The night is coming. You know, it is coming. You know, I, I mean, you don't even have to be a Christian. Now that things are getting worse, you know. And it's not that we're pessimistic. I mean, I would argue that, you know, I'll, I'll just share kind of my colors. I'm a pre-mill dis, uh, dispensational guy. I mean, I think really we have the most optimistic theology because as the night gets darker, we know the day is coming. The day is close at hand. And so like the text says, we're not distressed by that. We have comfort in that because we know that the day of the Lord for you, if you're a Christian, is a day where God will give you justice. It's a day that you'll, you will be with the Lord. You know, our hope is not so much the place of heaven as much it is the person of Christ. That is our hope, the person more than the place. Uh, but, you know, we, we are looking forward to those things. And so I, I hope in looking at those passages, you can see that the day of the Lord is going to come by surprise and it's going to come suddenly and inescapably. And before we just leave that, I just want to read our text one more time in verses 2 to 3. For you, your, This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. You know, Christ often describes his own coming as like a, time in, like a thief in the night. We'll come back to it later, but, you know, it's in Matthew 24 for those of you who are, you know, looking into the text. Uh, verse 3, while they are saying peace and safety, you know, again, like the people in the days of Noah or the people in the days of Lot, they're, they're not, they're not, they don't have any expectation of the day of the Lord. Hey, peace, safety, everything's okay. It's cool. It's good, man. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman who is pregnant and they will never escape. You know, the analogy of a woman in pregnancy who is going to give labor is given. You know, not all pregnancies are necessarily a medium, but you know when it's time to give birth to baby, it's time to go. You know, I, uh, my, I don't know that, but my wife does, you know, and uh, we, you know, when, when the baby can't, it's like, hey, like, you know, it's time to go to the hospital. This is happening now, or I think it's going to happen. And so this is how the day of the Lord will be. And last, I want to say one last thing before we get into now what do you and I do about it? Um, you know, there's a sort of doctrine taught by our government, you know, that, you know, we need to save the planet. And don't get me wrong. We want, to, we, we want to be good stewards of this planet. You know, God created us in Genesis chapter 1 to steward this planet, to take care of it. Um, you might even hear some people from certain seminaries, uh, particularly the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, you know, saying that we need to do with this thing uh, called creation care. And, uh, and I bring this to your attention because I want you to be informed. In the same way Paul wanted his people to be informed and not ignorant, I share this with you so that you too will be informed when you hear people talk about creation care or, or uh, carbon credits and all this stuff, you know? Um, like it's come to my attention, like even as I was preparing for this sermon that, you know, other seminarians and other seminaries, they're, they're teaching, preaching from the pulpit, hey, you need to engage in creation care, which means you need to spend your hard-earned money and buy carbon credits so we can save the planet. And uh, I, I would uh, tell you this now that this is not biblical. It's not supported by Scripture. And thirdly, you know, this is not the instruction we have um, in Scripture. You know, we're not, 
it, again, we care for the planet, but we're not, we don't conform to the environmentalist agenda, you know, which is the, the planet is the all in all. Even, you know, like, for example, overpopulation is allegedly a problem, so we need to kill thousands, maybe millions of little babies before they're born. And now, even after they're born, we can start killing them. You know, this is the worldview, the, or what's called cosmology, you know, the one's view of the cosmos, the world, you know, uh, not cause, you know, it's, it's order, you know, not just makeup, you know. Uh, you know, but I, I share this with you to say this world is going to go down in flames. We see that in Revelation 20, you know. Um, this world will not last forever. In fact, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We talked about this two weeks ago when I was here. You're going to have a new body, you know, which is to say the body you have now is for some purpose, to glorify God some way, somehow. You may not know, but you have a purpose for the body you have, so glorify God with it. Don't sin against God with your body, but use your body for God's glory. You may be young, you may be old, you may be little or, or taller, I don't know, but we are to use our bodies for God's glory. But in the same way, you will have a new and glorious body when Christ comes back. There is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. These, the, the existing heaven, the new earth, will pass away. And they must pass away because this earth is tainted by our sin. You see, when man was created, he has a relationship with the earth. And because man sinned, this world was tainted by sin. A new earth will be provided that is no longer tainted by sin. And there will be a new man who is not tainted by sin too, you and I. You know, because we've been saved by the second and better Adam, which is none other than Christ himself. And so now we come to the second part is how do we prepare? This is verses 4 to 10. I'll go ahead and read it here, verses 4 to 10. But you brothers are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So, you know, just taking this verse by verse, but you, so maybe you've noticed something in our passage. Uh, going back to verse 3, he speaks about they, and here he's speaking about you or we. There's a contrast here. So the people in verses 2 and 3 are the they. This is those who are not saved, those who are unprepared, unsuspecting for the day of the Lord. The we or the you are for those who are in Christ. Now, this is for you. If you are a Christian, what do you do about it? Do you stress out? Do you try to find out what day the Lord is coming? No, by no means. Instead, you are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. In other words, of all people, if you are a Christian, the day of the Lord should not come as a surprise to you if your hope is in Christ. If you're one who has a life expectant, life looking forward to Christ to come, this should not come as a surprise to you. But the implication is, for some of you, it might come as a surprise. You know, and again, uh, you know, Christians sometimes do bad things, and it's a terrible thing. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, they do bad things. And heaven forbid any of you should be caught off guard or your pants down or something terrible, you know. Uh, that, you know, bad things, people do bad things, Christians do bad things. Don't be one of them. Be ready. Be looking forward to Christ your King. So going back to verse 4 or 5, sorry, for you all, so you're not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. So in other words, though you don't know the day or the hour or the time, this time should not come like a thief to you. You shouldn't be caught off guard by this if your hope is in Christ. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. Why should it not be, why should it not catch you off guard? It's because of who you are. If, if you are a son of the light, the son of day, you know, not living in the night, not living in the darkness. You know, verse 6, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober. So this brings us to our three instructions, uh, which are basically don't sleep, stay awake, and stay sober. What does he mean by this? So looking at 6 and 7, he says, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So to be asleep is essentially to be apathetic, not care. Like when you, when you sleep, you sleep usually at the end of the day. Hey, everything's done. I've done what I had to do, or at least I don't care about it. I, I'm done for the day. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to bed. You know, these, there are people who live their life this way, who, you know what, there's nothing, I got nothing to do in this world except live for now, live for the pleasures, the delights of this world. And so they sleep. They don't care. And so Paul's instruction to you is don't be one who is apathetic, sorry. Don't be one who is apathetic. Don't be one 
who doesn't care about the coming of Christ. There are Christians who, you know, the thought of the coming of Christ just sounds too complicated, too strange, too weird, and so they, you know, they ignore it. That is not to be the case for you. Sound doctrine is essential for sound living. You need to know what the Bible says to live what it says. And so don't be apathetic. Next, uh, stay awake. This is, uh, you know, stay awake. Uh, verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Uh, in other words, don't get comfortable with this world. You know, maybe you've met people who call themselves carnal Christians, which is really an oxymoron. There's no real such thing. You know, if there's a quote-unquote carnal Christian, I would wager to you that this is no such thing. There, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. You know, a Christian who is comfortable in this world does not have heaven as their home. Uh, because this is their home, and for them, this will be the closest to heaven they'll ever be, uh, and that's a terrifying thought. Don't be such a person. You must not be comfortable in this world, and that's why, again, Paul uses the analogy of armor, not so much in the sense of, like, hey, fighting, like in Ephesians chapter 6, but in the sense of be at attention, be awake, be alert. Armor is not comfortable to roll around and sleep in the bed sheets, you know, because it's not, that's not what it's for. It's so you can stand at attention, be ready. You're on a mission, Christian. You have something to do. So be awake. And lastly, stay sober. That is, don't get drunk. Don't be distracted. Those who get drunk, they're Christians who get distracted with the things of the world, you know. Uh, to, the analogy of being drunk is to communicate, don't be intoxicated with this world, you know, not thinking soberly or rightly about the things to come. We get distracted, you know, about like, hey, the, you know, I can't go to church because the game's on, you know, I got to watch the game, you know, or, oh, I was going to go to church, but Disneyland, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and so don't be one who's drunk, or in other words, distracted, intoxicated with this world. And lastly, I want to bring us to how do we persevere? So we looked at the nature of the day of the Lord, it's going to come surprisingly, suddenly, and inescapably. How do you prepare for it? Um, by not sleeping. In other words, don't be apathetic. Eschatology has to matter to you if you are a Christian. Sound doctrine is essential for sound living. Also stay awake. Don't get comfortable in this world. The armor of God isn't so you can go to bed. It's so you can be ready this, the instruction of Ephesians chapter 6 is stand, stand firm, stand. It's stated three times for emphasis. And lastly, stay sober. Don't get drunk or intoxicated. Don't be distracted. Be focused, in other words. Have your focus on Christ. Have your focus on Christ. So lastly, how do we persevere? You know, Paul is preaching. Why would this message matter? He's preaching to people who've been persecuted, like we've read before in Acts chapter 17, the Jews, and later on even the Gentiles were persecuting their own countrymen, Christian Thessalonians. And so why does Paul share what he shares? He shares it so that they can be comforted and so that they can be edified, so that they can endure. They can endure the suffering that's coming. You know, who knows what the future holds for us, dear saints? You know, we're living in a kind of gnarly time. You know, election year's here. You know, there's a hurricane that's really devastated thousands of Americans on the East Coast. Um, you know, there's talks of riots, wars, all sorts of crazy stuff. Is it the case that we should stress and worry about these things by no means? Instead, Or is it also the case that we should just ignore it, like, hey, that doesn't matter. We're going to be with Christ, so it doesn't matter what's going on Hurricane Helene or whatever. Well, no, it does matter. It really does matter. But to say we don't think about these things the way the world thinks about them. We don't despair the way the world despairs. Instead, we're comforted with the knowledge that Christ will give justice to us for the justice that was denied to us. We have comfort knowing that this life is not the end. We have comfort knowing that the day of the Lord and his wrath is not for you if you are in Christ, because that wrath was paid on the cross. You know, I mentioned Zechariah chapter 14 earlier, where when Christ comes back, he's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives, the place where the Jews have time after time been defeated and humiliated by their enemies. Christ will defeat, def he'll defeat, defeat essentially. He's going to defeat failure. That's what he said. That's the message being communicated in Zechariah chapter 14 when he plants his feet on that place and treads it apart from east to west to say, there will be no more defeat. There will be no more conquering of my people. No more. I am the victor. Not me, but he is God. He is Yahweh. This is the God we are waiting for. This is the God we're looking forward to. 
And I would exhort you, comfort one, with one, one another, looking forward to him. Edify each other. When you suffer, when you're persecuted wrongly, when you're denied justice, when you see terrible things happening in our own times with the election or whatever happens after that, comfort one another with these words. This is not the end. Christ will make things right. If the election gets stolen, which we don't hope, but even then, Christ will make things right. And, you know, we're not ultimately looking forward to an elected official. We're looking forward to a monarch, a king, the king of kings. And so that is today's sermon. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, Christ Almighty, Yahweh, the Eternal One, the One who was, is, and is to come. God, I, I pray, Lord, thank you for your word, first and foremost, God, that we're not left alone in this world like orphans with no direction, no knowledge of what we are to do. You haven't left us in darkness or in ignorance, God, but you've given us light, the light of your word, God, so that we could be sanctified and so we could have light to share in this world, God, then and if by your means to even save your elect, God, through your power and not our own, God, like I mentioned in John 15, 5 earlier, Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing, God, even prepare for the day of the Lord. So, God, how are we to prepare for this calamitous, calamitous day, this time that is approaching, God? We are to do so by abiding in you, by remaining awake, staying sober, not sleeping, God. Would you help the people who have heard this message to care about what your word says, Lord, to know that they cannot live sound they will not have sound living without sound doctrine they need to know this the thessalonians who were an amazing church an exemplary church paul tells them that they needed to know this too god so that they could be comforted and edified and so i know a church like grace community church long beach these loving beloved people that you love that you live for and died for they need to know this too god lord would you prepare our hearts god as we leave this place as we fellowship and as we go about our business god Help us to be busy, not as busy bodies, but to be busy doing your business, God, be, to be doing the things that honor your name. Help us to be those who, are, when people look at the people in this church, that they would know these are people with expectancy, people who have a hope. When bad things happen or their loved ones pass away, they don't despair like others despair. It's not to say that we don't get hurt or we don't cry or we don't feel pain, but we, we don't despair the way the world despairs. We have hope in you. So help us look up and look forward to you. For the day of the Lord is our day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.